Thank you to Brother Jack for reading our scriptural text this morning, which came from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and the verses were 1 through 11. And it is from that passage of scripture that I would like to draw upon the blackboards of your minds and preach from the subject, the gospel we receive the gospel we received. The word gospel is found in your Bible, the English Standard Version of the Bible, 94 times. And that word gospel is only found in the New Testament. Evangelion, that is the Greek word for gospel. And when we use this word evangelion, we are talking about it being the message of evangelism. Evangelism is the activity. It is what is proclaimed publicly by the evangelist, who is identified as the messenger who engages in the activity to tell people about the evangelion, which is the gospel. Now, unfortunately, when many think of the gospel, they attempt to preach the gospel with a crossless Christ. But if we try to preach Christ without the cross, then all we're doing is preaching philosophy. But others try to preach a Christless cross instead of a crossless Christ. And whenever we preach a Christless cross, then we are preaching idolatry. And God has already told us that we should make no graven images, nor are we to have any other God before him. However, when we talk about the gospel, the gospel involves Christ and the cross. This is why we preach Christ and him crucified. Listen to your Bible. In 1 Corinthians, the chapter is 1, beginning with verse 18. The Bible reads, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will throw it. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greek, Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards, nor many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
and I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. My brothers and sisters, this is the message that we all should have received. This is the message that we are to believe. This is the message by which we are saved. This is the message that we are to profess. This is the message that we're supposed to hold fast to unless, like the apostle said, we believed in vain. My friends, to truly comprehend this message that we believe, profess, are saved by and hold fast to, then it is absolutely essential that we are reminded of the person, the primary point, and the proclamation of the gospel. First, let's talk about the person of the gospel. The person of the gospel is none other than Jesus Christ. Pentecostals get it wrong because all they want to talk about is the Holy Spirit. The Jews get it wrong because all they want to talk about is the Father. The Muslims get it wrong because all they want to talk about is Allah. But when we read the Bible and we are proclaimed to preach Christ, then that is the gospel that we are to preach. We glorify God by preaching Christ. We are guided by the Spirit when we preach Christ and him crucified. He is the person of the gospel. When we look at Jesus, we learn that Jesus proclaimed the gospel. When we read about the gospel, we learn quickly that Jesus is the gospel. And if we are confused as to how we are supposed to live according to the gospel, then we look to Jesus because Jesus actualizes the gospel. You have a Bible that has 66 books in it, 39 in the old, 27 in the new, and the entire Bible points us to Jesus Christ. When you read the Old Testament, it identifies Jesus as the promised event. When you read the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it shows Jesus as being the passionate evangelist. When you look at the book of Acts, we read how Jesus is the proclaimed exalted one. When we look at the letters in the Bible from Romans all the way to Jude, we learn that Jesus is our pious example. And when we get to the end of the story, reading the book of Revelation, we learn that Jesus is the perfected end. My friends, the Old Testament was written to prepare God's creation for the first coming of Christ. The New Testament was written to prepare God's creation for the second coming of Christ. The complete written revelation of God was written to make clear that the one who was promised and we have been waiting for has already come. He was sent by God to do the will of God and he fulfilled God's will. We read that in John chapter 4, verse 34. And the story never gets old. His story never gets old. It's the same old Jerusalem gospel that was preached yesterday to save the people then. It's the old Jerusalem gospel that we needed to hear to save us Today, it's the same old Jerusalem gospel that can save you today if you are yet to name the name of Christ. And even though the world may be passing away with all of its technological advances, if somebody wants to be saved tomorrow, if somebody wants to be saved next year, if somebody wants to be saved a decade from now, a score from now, a century from now, a millennia from now, if Jesus hasn't come back, it's to steal the same old Jerusalem gospel that will save them then. 
We have to continue to preach that good news from the graveyard. We know the story. Jesus gave his life a ransom yonder on Calvary, on Mount Calvary, cruel Calvary, paved the way by blood that we might win a bright shining crown. Praise his blessed holy name. Salvation has been brought down, O oh glory. Those who hear this message, those that believe this message, those that obey this message, God adds to the church of Christ. Because that's the only church that you can read about in the Bible. The church that preaches the gospel, which involves Christ, must also have a name that honors the king of the gospel, who is Jesus. We see that in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. My friends, the epistles were written to instruct and to remind the redeemed how we ought to behave ourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Now we labor patiently for our Lord to return, who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and our perfect end. Revelation chapter 22, verses 12 through 13. Jesus is the person of the gospel. But what is the primary point of the gospel? The primary point of the gospel is what we have read this morning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 1. The Bible reads, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand. My friends, although Christians, the gospel is something that we must be reminded of. Christians oftentimes fall away from God. Why? Because they have forgotten the gospel. They've forgotten who Jesus is. They have forgotten what Jesus has done for them. They have forgotten how good God is. They have forgotten who woke them up this morning. They have forgotten who started them on their way. They have forgotten who gave them the job that they don't even like going to. They have forgotten why they have more money at the end of the month rather than more month at the end of the money. It's because of Jesus. They have forgotten that. That's why we need to be reminded. There are so many people that don't want to come to all the services. There are so many individuals that feel that they are beyond an advanced daily Bible study. Why? Because they have the mindset that I've heard that already. He's not going to say anything new. I'm not going to learn anything new. Well, if it's new, it's not true. God has told us what we need, all that we need that pertains to life and godliness. We should be afraid if we're not hearing the same thing over and over and over again because God knows that his creation has memory issues. And therefore, we need to be reminded. We need to be reminded of the gospel. It is a timeless message that a timeless God invested his divine power in to provide a lost and dying world timeless salvation. Listen to your Bible. In Romans chapter 1 in the verses 16. Romans chapter 1 in the verses 16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why am I not ashamed of the gospel? I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for what purpose? For salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is the message the Corinthians received in Acts chapter 18, verse 8. And it is the same message lost souls receive today to become children 
of God. We need to be reminded of this message because the gospel is what we profess in our character. It is what we profess in our conduct. It is what we profess in our conversation at home, at work, in the community, and within our fellowship and communion. Oh, praise his name. But Paul is still, he still has something to say. Because we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 2, where he writes, And by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. The same Bible that says that we receive the gospel and need to stand in the gospel also shares with us that we are saved by the gospel. We heard the word, which is the gospel. If the word we heard was about the word, and that word is Jesus Christ, according to John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. See, like the Corinthians, when an individual hears the gospel, believes the gospel, and is obedient to the gospel by submitting to water baptism, then that soul is saved by the gospel. Yet being in Christ is the beginning of our journey, for we are commanded to hold fast to the gospel. And why are we told to hold fast to the gospel? Well, we are to hold fast to the gospel so we can stay saved. This is why we must constantly be reminded of it. When a person is sick of hearing about doctrine, sick of hearing about the gospel, then that person is advertising with their complaints that they have believed in vain. What else Paul has to say about this primary point of the gospel? Look at verses 3 and 4. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4, he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance that what, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. My brothers and sisters, Paul sets an example of what we are called to do as products of the gospel, and that is only deliver what we have received share what we did so others can duplicate and be saved. We have to recognize that we're nothing more than God's postal workers when it comes to delivering this love letter. Now, what would happen if your mailman receives something to send to you, but then he decides to deliver something else or something in addition to that? He will go to jail for that. And what do you think happens to us if we don't deliver what it is that we have received to deliver? My brothers and sisters, we cannot be taught wrong and believed right. We cannot be taught wrong and baptized right. We cannot be taught wrong and added to the right place. This is why what we hear is so important to the salvation of humanity. So what is the heart? of the gospel. What is the heart of this glorious message? Well, Paul tells us. He says the heart of the message is simple, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Isaiah 53, Christ was buried in a borrowed tomb. Matthew 27, 57 through 61. But I'm here to report this morning that death could not hold the creator of earth in the ground. For early on the first day of the week, when the S-U-N rose, God raised up the S-O-N because our Lord died on a Friday, day one, slept in a tomb on Saturday, day through, and up from the grave he arose on Sunday, day three. All of this happened in accordance with the scriptures, Psalm 16, verse 10. That's the gospel. But not only that, 
Paul goes on to talk about some eyewitnesses. We come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 5 through 8, where the Bible reads, and, he, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. My brothers and sisters, the gospel is amazing because this story not only has a happy ending, but eyewitnesses who can testify of a risen Savior who was slain on a cross. And after his resurrection, the Bible tells us that Jesus appeared to Cephas in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. And after Cephas, Jesus appeared to more, to more than 500 brothers at one time. Now, we have no gospel account that shares with us that this took place, but the Holy Spirit penned Paul to move Paul to write this. Therefore, God said it, and that should settle it. After the 500, Jesus appeared to James, then to all the apostles, those set apart, to the circumcised and uncircumcised, Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. And after these souls, Jesus finally appeared to Paul in Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. And so these are the witnesses of this glorious message but not only that my friends look at verse 9 in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 9 the Bible reads for I am the least of the apostles unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God my friends Paul is effective he is effective in the gospel because his humility is such that it is none of self and all of Jesus. Do we have the disposition that we are the least? Do we see ourselves as the least of all Christians, as the least of all our brethren, as the least of all the members at Northside, as the least of the deacons, as the least of the elders, as the least of the preachers? We need to recognize that humility is not thinking meanly of ourselves, but it is not thinking of ourselves at all because it is not about us. But it is rather all about God and doing his will. The Bible tells us that Paul himself saw himself as unworthy. Unworthy to be an apostle. Jesus called him to be an apostle and seeing the awesome work of an apostle and looking at what he has done with his life prior to that calling, he saw himself and still sees himself as unworthy. And whenever we think about the gospel, my brothers and sisters, our feelings ought to be the same. Don't you know that we are unworthy to commune with the Lord at his table, yet he invites us every Lord's day to partake in this authorized fellowship meal. We are unworthy to talk to God, yet God is merciful, for he hears our prayers and allow our cries to come before him. We are unworthy to give anything to God, for anything we give, we receive from him already. We can't beat God's giving, yet he takes our little bit, makes it more than enough, and by his hand, we are able to do great things with it. We are unworthy to sing his praises, for we are dust and our righteousness is like filthy rags, yet God hears the sacrifice of our lips anyhow, and it is offered up unto him as a sweet-smelling savor. All men, and I do mean all men, including this man, is unworthy to preach the gospel. Our experience, our education, our elocution, our enthusiasm, and our evangelism has never impressed God. Nor is it the reason why we are able to do what we do. A true gospel preacher preaches because woe to him if he doesn't preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 16. But I'm so glad that God doesn't call the qualified. Because if God called the qualified, I wouldn't be up here this morning. But I'm up here this morning because God has a way of qualifying the call. 
And that's why I'm able to serve a God who does such things. Brethren, we have all thought, we have all said, and we have all did something that if others knew, it will bring back all the guilt, all the shame, all the hurt, and all the defeat that we felt resulting from sin. But through the gospel, we are reminded that we may not be all that we ought to be now, but thank you, Jesus. We are not what we used to be. Amen. And that brings us to the conclusion of what he says in verses 10 and 11 in 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10 and 11, the apostle Paul writes, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me, whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. The gospel reminds Paul, the Corinthians, and us that we are what we are, not by our own merit, which is small, but it is by God's grace. It is by God's grace that we are able to do great things for King Jesus. See, we're all on team Jesus. And on team Jesus, there are no big eyes or some little U's. All of us have a faith that is built on the resurrection of a slain Savior, and his name is Jesus. That's the primary point of the gospel. And so as I bring this message to a close, We've talked about the person. We've talked about the primary point. Let's talk about the proclamation of the gospel. Because the gospel is not only something that needs to be lived. It is something that needs to pro be proclaimed. It is not something that just needs to be obeyed. But it's something that needs to be shared. It's not something that we only talk about when we're in the safety of these four walls. But it is something that must sound forth from this place. See, when we talk about proclamation, we're talking about a carefully crafted salvation message, which explains why a person must be saved, how Jesus can save them, what they must do to be saved, and the cost of discipleship. First, let's start with that first question. Why must a person be saved? A person must be saved because we have all sinned. Jesus tells us in John chapter 8, verse 44, that we are of our father, the devil, and the lust of our father we would do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks it of his own because he is a liar and he is the father of lies. This is what we have been taught to do. And because of that, we have separated ourselves from a holy and just God. Because those who practice sin, Jesus tells us, becomes a slave to sin. We're not servants of righteousness. We are servants of unrighteousness when we sin. John chapter 8, verse 34. If we die in this state, then we cannot be with Jesus. According to John chapter 8, verse 24. So how can Jesus save us? Jesus saves us when we believe in the authority of the only Son of God and how Jesus came from heaven not to condemn the world, but to save it. He came the first time so that we can be saved, John 3, 17 through 21. But when he comes again, he's not coming to save, he's coming to condemn because we didn't receive him when he came the first time. This is why the only date on God's calendar is now. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. And so, what must we do to be saved? In other words, what must we do? What must we do to receive the gospel? Well, we know the plan. We must hear of Christ, and we must hear Christ, John 6, 45. We must believe Jesus and believe in Jesus, John 3, 16. 
We must repent of our sins. That means we need to stop doubting, stop sinning, start believing, and start living righteously according to John chapter 20, verse 27. We need to confess Christ. Martha made that confession in John chapter 11, verse 27. And we need to make that confession because it's through that confession we show that we love the praises of God more than the praises of men, according to John chapter 12, verse 42 and 43. And we must be baptized by being born again of the water and of the spirit, according to John chapter 3, verse 5. Because until we have done such, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. And what is the cost of discipleship, my friends? The cost of discipleship is that if we love Jesus and what he has done for us, then we will keep his commandments. John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus himself says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so the question has to be asked, do we love Jesus this morning? Do we love the message that speaks of him this morning, where do you stand? Have you received the gospel? I'm asking, have you believed it? Because if you believe it, you will obey it. Are you ready to give up sin this morning? Are you ready? to openly and publicly confess Jesus to be the Son of God this morning? Are you ready to be baptized and have your sins washed away this morning? That when you come up out the water, having obeyed Jesus, the Father will forgive you of your sins, Acts 2.38. He'll make you a new creature in Christ Jesus According to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, what kind of creature? A creature that has not only received the message and stand in the message, but is being saved by the message because you're holding fast to the message. And God stands ready today to add you to his church, the only church that you can read about in your Bible, and that church is the church of Christ. The prophet said that this church was coming in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. Jesus said he was going to build that church in Matthew 16, 18. Don't you know that he actually built that church in Acts chapter 2? Purchased that church with his very own blood, according to Acts chapter 20, verse 28. And he adds to save to that church, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 47. And that church wears his name, according to Romans chapter 16, verse 16. Why not become a member of a going church for a coming Lord, which does all that God authorizes? Maybe you are a Christian on today, but for some reason you haven't been standing in the gospel you haven't been professing it you haven't been living by it you haven't been obedient to it you've let go of it through loose living lacks of morals whatever it may be that has separated you from God please come back to the Lord while he may be found because if you refuse to respond to the invitation if you refuse to come back to Jesus then it could be that this message that you claim to have received, you have believed it in vain. <clears throat> Repent, confess, pray that God will forgive you. We'll pray with you that God will forgive you. We will pray for you that God will forgive you because we serve a God that can do anything but fail. We serve a God that stands ready to forgive no matter what it is that you have done. We serve a God that is good. That's why he woke you up this morning. We serve a God that is merciful. He has not given you what you do deserve. We serve a God that is gracious. He stands ready to give you what you don't deserve. And that is a second chance and a third chance and another chance. We serve a God that is forgiving, that if you confess your faults, repent of your sins, he'll take your sins, cast them into the sea of forgetfulness, and remember them no more. 
That is the message of the gospel because that blood that Jesus shed wasn't just for, as Calvinists say, the elect, for Jesus died for the sins of the entire world. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And maybe you are a Christian, but for some reason, you've grown weak, you've grown weary. You just simply need strength to do what it is that you know you need to do. Maybe you're like the man that we constantly read about in the gospel accounts that says, Lord, I believe. I just need some help with my unbelief. Turn to God that he can give you Christ, that your strength can be renewed to overcome the stumbling blocks and the weights that so easily beset us so that we can serve him with strength and might. Whatever your need is, Jesus is calling you today, right here, right now. Make a wise-hearted decision while together we stand and sing.